Our Father and our God, what a wonderful God you are. The creator of the heavens and the earth, our personal creator. We thank you for the privilege of existing and enjoying all of the blessings that you pour out upon us. We especially thank you for your word, a very necessary uh, help in these trying times that we are living in. Father, we ask that as we open that word that your spirit will be with us to guide our thoughts and to open our hearts. And we thank you for hearing and answering our prayer, for we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. The first thing we want to do is review what we studied in our last presentation. And I'm going to do that in four specific points. Point number one, there is only one true God. And he is distinguished from all false pretenders by the fact that he is the creator. That distinguishes the true God from all false pretenders. Secondly, God created this world in six literal 24-hour days just as we know them today. And then he rested the literal seventh day of 24 hours. Point number three. Because God is the creator, God is entitled to the worship of his creatures. In other words, we must worship God because he is the creator. And finally, we studied in our last lecture that God has a sign, a seal, or a memorial that he is the creator, and he expects us to keep that memorial. And that memorial is the seventh day Sabbath. So uh, in capsule form, that is what we studied in our last lecture here together. Now the Bible mentions several titles and functions that belong to the Creator God alone and no one else. I'm going to mention several of those prerogatives and powers that belong only to God and you'll see in a few moments where we are going with this. First of all, the Bible tells us very clearly that the representative of God on earth is the Holy Spirit. When Jesus left, he said, I will send you another counselor to be with you. And he was talking about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is Christ's representative on earth. Secondly, the Bible tells us that God alone has the right to be addressed as our spiritual father. Only he can be called father in a spiritual sense. You can see that in Matthew 23 and verse 9. Also, the Bible tells us that we can only bow in reverence to God. And we're going to see a little bit later a couple of examples in the Bible where uh, a human being and actually a human being in both occasions bowed before an angel and before another human being and they were rebuked for doing that. So only can we bow before the true God. The Bible also tells us that God alone can forgive sins. God alone can forgive sins. Mark chapter 2 verse 7 is one of the texts that we could mention as an example. Another fact about God, the power and prerogatives of God, is that only God is infallible in His proclamations. There is no shadow of variation or turning in God, according to James chapter 1 and verse 17. The Bible also tells us that God alone has the right to set up kings and remove kings. You can find that in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 21. The Bible also teaches us that God alone can judge. And all, and God can be judged by none. So God is the judge and he can be judged by no one. And finally, the Bible teaches that it was the prerogative of God to establish the seventh day Sabbath as the memorial and sign that he is the creator. Those are some of the powers and the prerogatives that belong only to God. Now, in our study uh, last time, we read the first angel's message of Revelation chapter 14. 
God delivers three successive messages to the world right before the second coming of Christ. The first angel's message, I want to read that now, it's found in Revelation 14 verses 6 and 7. It calls us to worship the Creator. It calls every nation, kindred, tongue, and people to worship the Creator. Notice what we find in Revelation 14, 6, and 7. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and now notice, and worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. So God's last message to all of the nations of the world is to worship the Creator. And yesterday we noticed that the Creator has a memorial or a sign. What is that sign? It is the seventh day Sabbath, the observance of the seventh day Sabbath. Now there's a third message also uh, that God delivers to the world at the end of time, right before the second coming. And that third message is like the other side of the coin to the first. Let's read the third angel's message. It's found in Revelation 14, verses 9 through 11. Then a third angel followed them, that is, followed the first two angels, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. And now the same thing that, that is uh, mentioned at the beginning of this passage is repeated at the end. It says, And they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and whoever receives what? The mark of his name. Now let's summarize what we find in the third angel's message. First of all, it must be that the beast, which is the same as the little horn, right? We've studied this. The little horn or the beast must claim to occupy God's place on earth. You say, well, why would that be that, uh, that you say that the beast or the little horn claims to occupy God's place on earth? Because he commands the world to what? To worship him. So if he commands the world to worship him, it must be that he claims to be what? He claims to be God, or he claims to occupy the position of God. The third angel's message thus tells us, don't worship the beast. The first angel says, worship the Creator. The third angel's message says, don't worship the beast. It also tells us, don't receive the sign of the beast. Are you following me or not? And the third angel's message tells us that this is a matter of life and death. Because if you worship the beast, who must claim to be God because he's receiving worship, and you receive his sign or his mark, the Bible says that you will be eternally lost. This is a matter of life and death. It is a matter of salvation according to the book of Revelation. Now we need to ask the question, who is the beast and what is his mark? You know, if you don't want to worship the beast and receive his mark, well, you better know what the beast is and you better know what the mark is, or else you're going to end up worshiping the beast and receiving the mark. Now, we don't have to talk a lot about the beast or the little horn because we've already identified this power. We've looked at history, we've looked at the Bible, and we've seen that the beast represents what? The Roman Catholic papacy. Not individuals in the Roman Catholic Church, but the system, the organization, the papacy, is what is represented by the little horn or by the beast. We have not discovered this by guesswork or by conjectures. We have looked at history, we have looked at God's great prophetic chain, and we have seen the sequence of events, and the papacy fits right there in the chain of events in the place in which prophecy tells us that this place is. Now, somebody might object and say, well, Pastor Bohr, the papacy does not claim to occupy God's place on earth, does it? And if it doesn't claim to occupy God's place on earth, the papacy doesn't demand or require people to worship it. 
Therefore, the third angel's message cannot apply to the papacy because the papacy today doesn't claim to be God on earth, neither does it require people to worship it. That's the way the argument goes. However, is this argument true to fact? There is unmistakable evidence, folks, and we're going to notice that evidence, that the papacy claims to occupy the place of God on earth. The papacy claims the titles that belong only to God. The papacy claims to possess the rights that belong only to God. And the papacy claims to exercise the power and the functions that the Bible ascribes to God alone. So if the papacy claims to occupy the place of God, claims to have the right to the titles of God, claims to possess the rights of God and the powers and the prerogatives of God, then it must also demand worship because it's claiming to occupy God's place on earth. So the question is, what does the papacy claim? If the papacy claims to be God on earth, then it is asking people to worship, and we're going to notice that it has a sign of its authority or its power. Let's examine the biblical evidence concerning the papacy at this time. You'll notice that I have several subtitles in the material that you received uh, in our lecture today. The subtitle, In the Temple of God, is very important. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, the Apostle Paul describes the man of sin that was going to arise in the temple of God, claiming to be God. Let's read those verses, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Let no one deceive you by any means. For that day, it's talking about the day of the second coming, that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. The falling away in Greek is the apostasy. Unless the Jesus is not going to come until the apostasy takes place. There's going to be an apostasy in the church, in other words. And now notice, and the man of sin is revealed. The son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called what? God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Does the man of sin claim to be God as he sits in the temple of God? Absolutely. Now, evangelical Christians today say, well, when it speaks about the temple of God here, it's speaking about the rebuilding of a third Jewish temple in the Middle East. There are several problems with this perspective that is presented by the evangelical world and by the Protestant world in general. And that is that whenever the Apostle Paul uses the word temple, naos in Greek, it always refers to the Christian church or to the temple of our body. For example, 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. I'll just give you the references. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. 2 Corinthians 6, 16. And Ephesians 2, 21, which we're going to notice in, in a moment. Every time that Paul uses the word temple, naos, it refers to the Christian church, never to a literal rebuilt Jewish temple. Furthermore, the Bible tells us very clearly that the Jewish temple after the death of Christ, after the stoning of Stephen, no longer was the temple of God. In fact, when Jesus entered in his triumphal entry, which is described in Matthew chapter 21, into Jerusalem, we're told there that he entered the temple of God. Notice that when he entered, it's called the temple of God. Then Jesus threw out the money changers and he said, this is my house. So he entered what is called the temple of God. He said, it is my house. But then after uh, giving his woes upon the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious leaders, in Matthew 23 and verse 38, Jesus left the temple and he said, your house is left unto you desolate. So in other words, when Jesus left the temple the last time, it was no longer God's house, it was what? It was their house. 
Now, I want to show you one example in the writings of Paul of what the temple of God is. It is not a rebuilt Jewish temple where a literal nasty person is going to sit for three and a half literal years uh, and persecute the Jews. That is alien to the teachings of the Apostle Paul. Notice Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22, so that you can see that the temple that Paul speaks about is a spiritual temple. It is the church, the spiritual worldwide church. Notice what it says there in Ephesians 2.19. Now therefore, he says to the Ephesians, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. And now notice, having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. What are the foundations of this building? People, the apostles and the prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief what? Are we talking about a literal, literal cornerstone? No, the cornerstone is a person. Jesus is the chief cornerstone. Now the believers are the stones that are built up on the foundation because it says, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a what? A holy temple in the Lord. So let me ask you, is the church the temple? Yes. What are the foundations of this temple? The apostles and prophets. Who is the chief cornerstone of this temple? Jesus Christ. Who is the Shekinah that enters the temple? In the Old Testament, it was the visible glory of God. But notice who is the presence in this temple. He says, in whom, verse 22, you are also built together for a dwelling place of God in the what? In the spirit. So who is the Shekinah today? It is not a visible glorious light. It is the Holy Spirit. So for the Apostle Paul, the temple of God is what? The church, spiritually speaking. So where would we expect this man of sin to sit if he sits in the temple of God? He must rise within the Christian church. Are you with me or not? We're not to seek for him over in the Middle East, some leader of ISIS over there, some Syrian Jew as some people believe. No, 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 no. We are to look for the Antichrist, the man of sin, within the bosom of the Christian church because the Apostle Paul defines that as the temple of God. Now we have another subtitle, In Place of Christ. You know, the succession of Roman Catholic popes has claimed two titles. One is Vicarious Fili Dei. It means Vicar of the Son of God. Another title that they have claimed is Vicarius Christi. That means Vicar of Christ. Now, what does the word Vicar mean? The word Vicar means one who occupies the place of. A Vicar takes the place of someone else. Now, let me ask you, when Jesus went to heaven, who did he live, leave on earth as his Vicar? Who did he leave on earth to take his place? It was the Holy Spirit. But the papacy believes that Jesus Christ on earth is found in whom? In the Roman bishop or in the pope. Incidentally, the word antichrist is very interesting. We usually think of that word antichrist as meaning against Christ. But the Greek word antichristos actually can mean not only someone who is against Christ, it can mean someone who claims to occupy the place of Christ. You see, the preposition anti can mean also in place of. So the Antichrist is not someone who is an atheist and defies the God of heaven. The Antichrist is someone who claims to occupy the place of Christ. That's what Antichrist means. Now, for example, in classical Greek, you have the word anti-basileus. Basileus is king. So the word anti-basileus means one who occupies the place of the king. It's not someone who's against the king. It's someone who takes the place of the king, the vicar of the king, if you please. You find in the New Testament the word antipas. The word pas is father. Antipas means he who rules in place of his father. So once again, anti means in place of. You have the word anti-type. Have you ever heard the word anti-type? The lamb is the type and Jesus is the anti-type. What does that mean? 
It means that when Jesus dies, he takes the place of the type. You don't have to sacrifice lambs anymore because Jesus takes the place of the sacrifices. He's not against the sacrifices. He takes the place of the sacrifices. He fulfills them. So we find that the word antichrist does not necessarily mean someone who is against Christ, but it means someone who claims to occupy the place of Christ or the place of God. Let me read you some statements from Roman Catholic sources. Pope Leo XIII, in an encyclical letter dated June 20, 1894, spoke, uh, wrote these words, We hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. Once again, Leo XIII stated on January 10, 1890, the following, But the supreme teacher in the church is the Roman pontiff. Union of minds therefore requires, together with a perfect accord in the one faith, complete submission and obedience of the will to the church and to the Roman pontiff as to God himself. Absolute obedience to the Roman pontiff as to whom? As to God himself. The famous Roman Catholic encyclopedia, Prompta Bibliotheca, edited by Lucius Ferraris, has these words. The Pope is of so great uh, authority and power that he can modif modify, explain, or interpret even divine laws. The Pope can modify divine law since his power is not of man but of God. And he acts as vice-regent, vice-regent means vice-ruler, uh, of God upon earth with most ample power of binding and loosing his sheep. Whatever the Lord God himself and the Redeemer is said to do, his vicar does, provided that he does nothing contrary to the faith. And by the way, this encyclopedia is not some offshoot encyclopedia. This encyclopedia, according to the Roman Catholic Encyclopedia, volume 6, page 48, is referred to as a veritable encyclopedia of religious knowledge and a precious mine of information. And it bears the imprimatur or the authorization of the Roman Catholic Church. Not only does the Pope claim to be uh, to occupy the place of Christ, which is the meaning of Antichrist, but the papacy also allows uh, people to refer to its leader as Holy Father. In Matthew 23, verse 9, Jesus said, We are to call no man on earth our what? Our Father, spiritually speaking. Doesn't mean that I can't call my dad Father. It's speaking in spiritual terms. You can look at the context. Jesus says, don't call any man your spiritual father. The Pope not only allows people to call him father, he allows people to call him holy father, a title that belongs only to God. The Bible tells us that we are to only bow before God. We are to bow before no man. When um, You remember when um, Cornelius uh, came to where Peter was. Uh, the Bible says that Cornelius bowed before Peter. And what did Peter say? Yes, kiss my ring, kiss my toe. No, that's not what he said. Peter said, you stand up, for I am a man like you are a man. And in Revelation 19, verse 10, and 22, verses 8 and 9, John bowed before an angel, and the angel said, stand up. You can only bow before whom? Before God. Let me ask you, does the Pope allow and encourage people to bow before him? He most certainly does. In fact, in a document called Dictatus Papai, which is 27 statements that were written by Pope Gregory VII in, a, in the year 1075, in Article 9, uh, the Pope says this, that of the Pope alone, all princes shall kiss his feet. Interesting. Furthermore, the papacy claims to have the power to what? To forgive sins. While the Bible teaches that only God can forgive sin, the papacy says, we can forgive sin. Our Roman Catholic Church is filled with confessionals where people confess their sins and receive supposedly absolution from the priest. Absolutely. Now, St. Alphonsus Liguori, one of the 33 doctors in the history of the Roman Catholic Church, who was canonized as a saint by Pope Gregory XIV in 1839, 
and was proclaimed a doctor of the church by Pope Pius IX. One of the great theologians in the history of the Roman Catholic Church wrote a very interesting book where he described what he believed was the power of the priest. And I want you to notice what he states in his book, Dignity and Duties of the Priest or Selva, page 34. When he ascended into heaven, Jesus Christ left his priests after him to hold on earth his place. What, what is this saying? Once again, when he ascended into heaven, Jesus Christ left his priests after him to hold on earth his place of mediator between God and men. The Bible says we have one mediator between God and men, Jesus Christ. Continue saying, particularly on the altar. The priest holds what? The place of the Savior himself. When by saying, ego te absolvo, this means I forgive you, he absolves or he forgives from sin. My Bible tells me that only God can forgive sin. So if the papacy claims to forgive sin, are they claiming to occupy God's place on earth? Absolutely. You, probably most of you know that from December 8, 2015 through November 20, 2016, uh, Pope Francis has proclaimed what is called the year of mercy. He's even goes, gone so far as to say that if a woman who has aborted a baby truly repents of the sin of abortion, that she can go to her priest and the priest can give her absolution. The priest can forgive her sin. And interestingly enough, the whole matter of indulgences for sin is what led to the Protestant Reformation. And there are some Protestant churches that are planning with the Roman Catholic Church to celebrate the 500th year of the posting of the 95 Thesis in October of next year, Protestants and Catholics together. Amazing. The pap papacy also claims, when it speaks on faith and morals, to be infallible. In fact, at Vatican Council I in the year 1870, the dogma of papal infallibility was proclaimed. I want to read a description of this, uh, of this very blasphemous dogma of the Roman Catholic Church. Here's the description. This is from the Dogmatic Constitution on the Catholic Faith. We teach and define that it is a dogma divinely revealed that the Roman pontiff, when he speaks ex cathedra, that is from the throne, from the papal throne, that is when in discharge of the office of pastor and doctor of all Christians, by virtue of his supreme apostolic authority, he defines a doctrine regarding faith or morals to be held by the universal church by the divine assistance promised to him in blessed Peter, is possessed of that infallibility with which the divine Redeemer willed that his, his church should be endowed for defining doctrine regarding faith or morals. And that therefore such definitions of the Roman pontiff are irreformable of themselves and not from the consent of the church. But if anyone which may God avert presume to contradict this our definition, let him be anathema. Anathema means let him, be, let him be cursed. So does the papacy claim infallibility when it speaks on faith and morals? But my Bible tells me that only one is infallible. Notice what Pope Nicholas I had to say. He ruled from, 18, from 858 uh, A.D. to 867 A.D. He stated this, It is evident that the popes can neither be bound nor unbound by any earthly power, nor even by that of the apostle Peter if he should return upon the earth. Since Constantine the Great has recognized that the pontiffs, listen now carefully, held the place of God upon earth, divinity not being able to be judged by any living man. They're claiming divinity. Then he stated, we are then infallible, and whatever may be our acts, we are not accountable for them but to ourselves. Isn't that interesting? That's blasphemous, folks. Does the papacy claim the rights and prerogatives of God? Must it then claim worship? Absolutely. Now notice this statement about what happens when the pope speaks on faith and morals. This is uh, the Ca Roman Catholic theologian Fritz Leist. He said, the infallibility of the Pope is the infallibility of Jesus Christ himself. Whenever the Pope thinks 
It is God whom, himself who is thinking in him. See, this is, they're incriminating themselves by what they're writing. Now, the Bible tells us that only God can set up kings and remove kings. But the papacy claims to have that divine right of setting up kings and removing kings. At the Council of Trent, notice the decision that was made. All temporal power is his, that is the Pope's. The dominion, jurisdiction, and government of the whole earth is his by divine right. All rulers of the earth are his subjects and must submit to him. Gregory VII, in Dictatus Papai, Article 12, which we already mentioned what this document is, stated that it may be permitted to him, that is the Pope, to depose emperors. Now, you can read this rather long statement because we don't have the time to read this long statement from Pope Boniface VIII in, thir in 1302. It's a, a papal bull called Unam Sanctum where he says that the civil power has to be subject to the religious power and that the, and that the religious power, because it's higher in the sight of God, has a right to set up kings and to remove kings. But my Bible tells me that only God has the right to set up kings and to remove kings. The papacy also claims that the Pope is the supreme judge of the earth. Notice once again, Dictatus Papai, Gregory the Seventh, 1075, in Article 18, he says that his, that is the Pope's, sentence is not to be reviewed by anyone, while he alone can review the decisions of all others. In Article 19 of this same document, uh, Pope Gregory the Seventh said that he, that is the Pope, can be judged by no one. And St. Alphonsus Liguori, this uh, renowned theologian of the Roman Catholic Church, expressed it this way, so that if it were possible that the angels might err in the faith or might think contrary to the faith, they could be judged and excommunicated by the Pope for he is of so great dignity and power that he forms the one and the same tribunal with Christ. Can you imagine the Pope <laughs> doing that, judging and excommunicating the angels? Come on, be real. But that's what the papacy claims. Most of the world is oblivious to this. Most Roman Catholics don't have the foggiest idea that this is Roman Catholic theology. And many, when, when I share this, they're surprised. They say, does the church really believe that? Is that what they've said? That's exactly what they say. And there's much more that I have not included in this lecture because we don't have that time to cover it. But there's another blasphemous came, uh, uh, claim of the papacy. And that is that the, the priest, when he performs the rite of the mass or the sacrifice of the mass, he becomes the creator of his creator. Notice the way that Liguori expressed it in his book, pages 33 and 34. This is the epitome of blasphemy. Thus the priest may, in a certain manner, be called the creator of his creator, since by saying the words of consecration, he creates, as it were, Jesus in the sacrament by giving him a sacramental existence and produces him as a victim to be offered to the Eternal Father. As in creating the world, it was sufficient for God to have said, let it be made, and it was created. He spoke, and they were made. So it is sufficient for the priest to say, hoc est corpus meum, that is, this is my body, and behold, the bread is no longer bread, but the body of Christ. The power of the priest, says St. Bernardine of Siena, is the power of the divine person. For the transubstantiation of the bread requires as much power as the creation of the world. What do you think? That's blasphemy. That man can create the creator? Be real. That's the epitome of blasphemy. So let me ask you, so far what we've looked at, uh, could we say that the papacy, the beast, claims worship because he claims to be God? Absolutely. Now, some people say, well, but Pastor Bohr, the papacy has changed. It's toned it down. Of course, 
If the Pope today said, I'm God on earth, and he said all these things openly, nobody on earth would pay any attention to him. The papacy has toned it down, but listen carefully. The papacy has changed externally, but at her core, the papacy is the same system that it was in the past because she cannot change her DNA. If she changed her DNA, she would cease to be the Roman Catholic Church. Ellen White wrote a very interesting statement that I want to read. It's found in Great Controversy, page 571, on how the papacy adapts to the circumstances in which it, in which it finds itself. This is how it states, The Roman Church now presents a fair front. And the motto of the Roman Catholic Church is semper idem, that means always the same. So the Roman Church now presents a fair front to the world. Covering with apologies her record of horrible cruelties, she has clothed herself in Christ-like garments, but she is unchanged. Every principle of the papacy that existed in past ages exists today. The doctrines devised in the darkest ages are still held. Let none deceive themselves. The papacy that Protestants are now so ready to honor is the same that ruled the world in the days of the Reformation when men of God stood up at the peril of their lives to expose her iniquity. She possesses the same pride and arrogant assumption that lorded it over kings and princes and claimed the prerogatives of God. Her spirit is no less cruel and despotic now than when she crushed out human liberty and slew the saints of the Most High. The papacy is just what prophecy declared that she would be, the apostasy of the latter times. It is part of her policy to assume the character which will best accomplish her purpose. Do we see that happening with Pope Francis I? Oh, if you haven't noticed that, you, you've been at some other planet or you've been sleeping. Then she gives the best de definition of the papacy that I've ever found. She says, But beneath the variable appearance of the chameleon, she conceals the invariable venom of the serpent. Now, the most arrogant claim of the Roman Catholic papacy, which proves that the papacy claims to be God and demands to be worshipped or obeyed, is the change of the day of worship from Sabbath to Sunday, the change in God's holy law. You remember that the Bible tells us that the little horn thought that it could change the law? And the little horn is the same as the what? The same as the beast. So the little horn or the beast thought that it could change God's holy law. They say that this power was conferred upon her by God himself. That if the church wanted to change the day, the church could change the day. Let me give you just a few remarks about uh, one example uh, of this in Roman Catholic theology. On May 31, 1998, Pope John Paul II published a document titled Apostolic Letter Dies Domini of John Paul II to the clergy, the episcopate, and the faithful on keeping Sunday holy. This is a document that he wrote to the laity and to the clergy. And he begins by quoting the book of Genesis. This is what he states, speaking about the Sabbath. In the first place, therefore, the day of rest is so because it is the day blessed by God and made holy by Him, set apart from the other days to be among all of them the Lord's day. Who could argue with that? He's talking about the Sabbath in Genesis. Did God bless the Sabbath in Genesis? Yes. Did He make it holy? Yes. Was it the Lord's day? Absolutely. But that's where things change in this apostolic letter. Because then what the Pope in, does in the rest of his letter is he takes everything that the Bible applies to the Sabbath, he applies it to Sunday. There are many places where he openly contradicts the Bible, and I'm going to share several of those with you. How is it that the papacy can claim to have the authority of God when the papacy openly contradicts what the Bible teaches? I want you to notice, first of all, that the Pope calls the Sabbath the Jewish Sabbath several times in his apostolic letter. There is not one reference in the Bible that calls the Sabbath the Jewish Sabbath. It is always called 
the Sabbath of the Lord your God, or it is called the Holy Day of the Lord, and God, God calls it my holy day. It is always God's holy day. It is not the holy day of the Jews. The Pope also places a conflict between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. I read one statement that he gives in this letter. In the light of this mystery, he's speaking about the resurrection of Christ, the meaning of the Old Testament precept concerning the Lord's day is recovered, perfected, and fully revealed in the glory which shines on the face of the risen Christ. So, and then he says, we move from the Sabbath, that is from the seventh day, to the first day after the Sabbath. From the seventh day to the first day, the Dies Domini becomes the Dies Christi. Do you know what he's saying in this statement? Basically what he's saying is that in the Old Covenant, the day of rest was the Sabbath, but in the New Covenant, because Christ resurrected, the day of rest should be Sunday. Let me ask you, has he borrowed this argument from Protestants? Isn't it Protestants that create a dichotomy between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant? The problem with this argument is that the Sabbath was not part of the Old Covenant because the Sabbath was made in, in Garden of Eden before there was any sin, before there was any Old Covenant. It's part of God's original plan. So to say that the Sabbath was, you know, for the Jews, it's for the Old Covenant, but now in the New Covenant we have a new day of worship simply isn't biblical because God created the Sabbath before there was an Old Covenant. Furthermore, the Bible tells us that when everything is restored, God's people will go and worship before the Lord from Sabbath to Sabbath. Incidentally, I find it quite interesting that the papacy would say that the Sabbath belongs to the Old Covenant, and yet the Roman Catholic papacy continues so many of the Old Testament customs. They light candles, they sprinkle holy water, they sacrifice at altars, they robe themselves with priestly garments, they burn incense, they put mitres on their heads. In other words, they continue basically the Old Testament cultists, but they say, well, the day of worship is not the same day of worship that existed in the Old Testament. The day of worship now is a different day of worship. John Paul, in this letter, also states that Sunday is supposed to be kept every week as a memorial of the resurrection. Now, there's a real problem here. Let me ask you, how many times a year does the papacy celebrate Palm Sunday? Once. How many days of the year does the papacy celebrate um, Holy Wednesday? How many days out of the year do they celebrate Holy Thursday, Jueves Santo, once a year? How many days a year do they celebrate Holy Friday? Once a year. So if all of the days of the Passion are celebrated once a year, why is the resurrection of Jesus celebrated every week? It makes no sense. There is no place in the Bible that says you're supposed to celebrate the resurrection every week. But there is a commandment that says that you should celebrate God as creator one day a week. And that week, that day is what? That day is the Holy Sabbath. One of the real serious things that the Pope says in this uh, apostolic letter is that he says that God has placed his seal on Sunday. He quotes St. Augustine, one of the great doctors of the Roman Catholic Church, and I read now, St. Augustine notes in turn, Therefore the Lord has placed His seal on this day, which is the third day after the Passion. So he's saying God's seal is found where? On Sunday. Which day contains the seal of God? The day which is the seal or sign of God we've studied is what? the Holy Sabbath. The only commandment in the Ten Commandments that has the three elements necessary for a seal is the Fourth Commandment. You have the name of the giver of the law. His name is the Lord thy God. We have His office or His function. What is He? He's the Creator. And number three, the territory over which He rules. Heaven, earth, the sea, and everything that is in them. Ellen White has well explained that when the papacy changed the day of worship, they removed the seal from the law of God and the Pope placed his own seal in there. 
Let me read this statement. It's found in Great Controversy, page 452. The seal of God's law is found in the fourth commandment. This only of all the ten brings to view both the name and the title of the lawgiver. It declares him to be the creator of the heavens and the earth, and thus shows his claim to reverence and worship above all others. Aside from this precept, there is nothing in the Decalogue to show by whose authority the law is given. When the Sabbath was changed by the papal power, the seal was taken from the law. The seal that identifies who was the lawgiver, and it also identifies who was the creator, because God made the Sabbath as his signature on creation. This is very serious, folks. It's usurping the position of God. In paragraph 55 of this apostolic letter, Pope John Paul II makes this blasphemous claim. Blessed be he who has raised the great day of Sunday above all other days. The heavens and the earth, angels and of men, give themselves over to joy. Now, who is it that elevated Sunday above every other day? The papacy. So what is he saying? What is he he's saying? Blessed be the papacy who raised Sunday above all other days, because the papacy claims to have changed the day. The Pope also says that when everything is finished and we're in a new heavens and a new earth, we will live on an eternal Sunday. Notice this statement that we find in paragraph 84. From Sunday to Sunday, enlightened by Christ, she goes forward towards the unending Sunday of the heavenly Jerusalem, which has no need of sun or moon to shine upon it, for the glory of God is its light and its lamp is the Lamb. So what he's saying is when we get to the kingdom, there will be an unending what? Unending Sunday. But what does the Bible teach? The Bible teaches very clearly that there will be months in the new earth because we will go from month to month to worship before the Lord and to eat from the tree of life. There will also be days, weeks in the earth to come. And it's not an endless Sunday that will exist, but God's people will go every Sabbath to worship before the Lord. So he openly contradicts the Bible by speaking of an endless Sunday when the Bible says that there will be a weekly cycle and God's people will worship the Creator on the Holy Sabbath. But you know what he does in this letter? For a very long time until recent times, Roman Catholic writers would actually uh, make fun of Protestant writers by saying, you know, you po folks say that you go by the Bible. You say that you get everything from the Bible. But the Bible says, doesn't say anywhere you're supposed to keep Sunday. It was the Roman Catholic Church that changed the day from Sabbath to Sunday. So when you keep Sunday, you're accepting the authority of the Roman Catholic Church. That's the way they argued, that the Sunday was not in the Bible. But in this apostolic letter, Pope John Paul II knows that he wants to win over Protestants and he will not be able to win them over by saying that by keeping Sunday they're following the tradition of the Roman Catholic Church. So he quotes the very same arguments that, that Protestants have always used in favor of Sunday to give it a, a semblance of being in Scripture. Let me just mention the several things that he says in paragraphs 20 and 21. Six times he says Jesus resurrected on the first day of the week. Then he says, on the first day of the week, he walked and talked with two of his followers on the road to Emmaus. On the first day of the week, he appeared to the 11 apostles in the evening. A week later on a Sunday, Jesus appeared to the apostles once again. On the day of Pentecost, which was on a Sunday, the Holy Spirit was poured out. The first proclamation of the gospel took place on Sunday. The first baptisms on the day of Pentecost took place on Sunday. Christians were taking their offerings to church on the first day of the week. You know that argument, 1 Corinthians 16. The Apostle Paul met with the church of Troas on the first day of the week. And Revelation calls the first day of the week the Lord's Day. He's using the very arguments that Protestants use in favor of Sunday because he knows that he will not be able to win over Protestants by saying that the day was changed by the tradition of the Roman Catholic Church, because he knows that Protestants do not go by tradition. Are you understanding what he's doing? Now, this gets even more serious, because neither Benedict, Pope Benedict, 
nor John Paul, nor Francis I even believed that the days of creation were literal. In fact, Pope Francis and John Paul both believe that this world came to an, into existence by a long and cruel process of evolution. And Francis I refers to creation as a symbolic story. Let me read you what John Paul had to say about the creation story. Uh, this is uh, in a speech that he gave to the Papal Academy of the Sciences. Today, almost half a century after the publication of the encyclical, and this is an encyclical by Pope Pius XII, Humane Generis, 1950. He says, since the publication of that encyclical, new knowledge has led to the recognition of the theory of evolution as more than a hypothesis. It is indeed remarkable that this theory has been progressively accepted by researchers following a series of discoveries in various fields of knowledge. The convergence, neither sought nor fabricated, of the results of work that was conducted independently is in itself a significant argument in favor of the theory. He says scientists have, uh, in different fields, have done a study of this and they've independently come to the conclusion that evolution is not a hypothesis, evolution actually took place. So he's saying that this world did not come into existence in seven literal days. Notice what uh, Pope Francis I had to say. He, in typical Jesuit fashion, he's trying to reconcile the creation story with science. He said this, The Big Bang, which today we hold to be the origin of the world, does not contradict the intervention of the divine creator, but rather requires it. Evolution in nature is not inconsistent with the notion of creation, because evolution requires the creation of beings that evolve. When we read about creation in Genesis, we run the risk of imagining God as a magician with a, magi with a magic wand able to do everything. But that is not so. He created human beings and let them develop according to the internal laws that he gave to each one of them so they would reach their fulfillment. In other words, he, he placed within man the capacity to evolve. So neither one of these popes believed in the story of creation. <laughs> now what does the Catholic Church say about its authority? Notice uh, several statements that I'm going to read now about how the Roman Catholic Church sees its authority. It was the Catholic Church which by the authority of Jesus Christ has transferred this rest to Sunday in remembrance of the resurrection of our Lord. Thus the observance of Sunday, listen to this, by Protestants is an homage they pay in spite of themselves to what? To the authority of the church. So when Protestants keep Sunday, whose authority are they accepting? The authority of the papacy because the papacy changed the day. Now notice this statement. A word about Sunday. God said, remember the Sabbath day. Remember that thou keep holy the Sabbath day. The Sabbath was Saturday, not Sunday. Why then do we keep Sunday holy instead of Saturday? The church altered the observance of the Sabbath to the observance of Sunday. Now he indicts Protestants. Protestants who say that they go by the Bible and the Bible only, and that they, they, that they do not believe anything that is not in the Bible, must be rather puzzled by the keeping of Sunday when God distinctly said, keep holy the Sabbath day. The word Sunday does not come anywhere in the Bible, so without knowing it, they are obeying the authority of the Catholic Church. So by keeping Sunday, Protestants are obeying the authority of whom? Of the Catholic Church. Notice this statement, but since Saturday, not Sunday, is specified in the Bible, isn't it curious that non-Catholics who profess to take their religion directly from the Bible and not from the church observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Yes, of course it is inconsistent, but this change was made about 15 centuries before Protestantism was born, and by that time the custom was universally observed. They, Protestants, have continued the custom, even though it rests upon the what? The authority of the Catholic Church, and not upon an explicit text in the Bible. That observance by Protestants of Sunday remains as a reminder of the Mother Church, the Sabbath is a reminder of what? 
of the Creator God. But Sunday is a reminder of what? Of the Mother Church, from which the non-Catholic sects broke away. Like a boy running away from home, but still carrying in his pocket a picture of his mother or a lock of her hair. One final statement. It was the Holy Catholic Church that changed the day of rest from Saturday to Sunday, the first day of the week. And it not only compelled all to keep Sunday, but urged all persons to labor on the seventh day under pain of anathema. Protestants who profess great reverence for the Bible, and yet by their solemn act of keeping Sunday, they acknowledge the power of the Catholic Church. The Bible says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. But the Catholic Church says, no, keep the first day of the week. And now notice this, and lo, the entire civilized world bows down in reverent obedience to the command of the Holy Catholic Church. Are you catching the picture? Listen, folks. The trial at the end of time is not so much a trial over days. The day is simply the way in which God reveals which authority you accept. If you keep the Sabbath, you are saying, I follow and obey the authority of God because God established the Sabbath. But when you keep Sunday as the day of rest, rest, you're saying, I accept the authority of the power that changed the day of worship. I accept the power of the papacy because they were the ones that changed the day. So the matter at the end of time is not only a matter of days, it's a matter of which authority you accept. And the Bible tells us that the whole world, with the exception of a small remnant who keep the commandments of God, will wonder after the beast and obey the sign of its authority. Did you understand what we studied this evening? This was a difficult lecture because there's so many quotations and there's so much material. But I believe you've seen the picture. The papacy does claim to occupy God's place on earth. It does claim the need to receive worship and it does have a sign of its authority. And God also claims authority because he is the creator and God has a sign. So at the end of time, two days, two signs of authority.